one of them. Mr. Peacock? Good, how are you? Welcome. All right, I think that we are at the state's next and final last witness, Dr. Lazaro. Correct. Um, doctor, let me ask just to get it right because I've heard it pronounced different ways. Is it Lazaro or Lazaro? It's Lazaro. Lazaro. I apologize for any mispronunciations of it that I've made. Everybody does it, even people in my family. All right. Um, I think, though, we're ready as soon as the jury hears, right? Is the state ready? Yes, sir. And defense ready? Yes, sir. All right, we're just waiting for the uh, jury. And just to verify, the plan is still, once uh, this witness is done, we are going to go into closing arguments, and we are going to bring them back in the morning and instruct them and allow them to begin deliberations. That's the plan. I, that's the plan, Judge. I'm, I'm not sure if you realize that Ms. Holt was doing the cross, so <laughs> that's late plans. Might be, uh, Ms. Holt, how long is your cross? You've been, you've been fairly good on your estimates of time. I'm not saying that your cross will be a long time, but just rough less estimate of uh, your, your time. If I had to guess between an hour and an hour and a half. Ooh. Ooh. But, of course. All right, well, we'll, we'll see if we, if we need to reevaluate closings because, again, I don't know if I want to start closings at 4 o'clock if you all have asked for three hours. That's probably not going to happen. Yeah, all right. I, I don't. I don't necessarily mind. Direct will be much more than an hour, but about an hour. So, I mean, if first is an hour, it's a possibility we get to the yeah. Yeah. I just. I want the court to be aware that I. All right. Well, the the goal is the the target is anywhere close to two o'clock. You know, two thirty even. Because um, if we do three hours of closing, you have to an hour and a half. Um, but if we get past two thirty, then that's where we're going to have to reevaluate. I'm not going to call it right now, but we, if we get past 2.30, we're going to need to have a talk. Judge, I think you had already mentioned that you'd be willing to ask the jurors what they want. That's true. That's true. That's so, so they, they all need to agree? No, that's true. Yeah, no, a absolutely. Um, as far as still doing that, stating that same plan, doing closings and then sending them home. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I still think we need to inquire that one juror whether I, they've been able to change their vacation plans. Or I agree. My plan was to do it after um, the next witness before we do closing. <laughs> right. Jury is present and seated. Everyone else may be seated at this time. Ladies and gentlemen, jury, welcome back. I hope everybody had a nice lunch. Uh, but I have to ask, did anyone discuss the case with anyone else or amongst yourselves? Did anyone do any research related to the case? Or was anyone exposed to any reports of the case outside of the courtroom by show of hands? Let the record reflect no show of hands. Again, thank you all very much. We are going to pick up where we left off, and I'm going to ask the state to call their next rebuttal witness. The state will call Dr. Emily Lazaro. Dr. Lazaro, if you'll come forward, please. Wherever you're comfortable, if you'll face me to be sworn. Thank you, Doctor. Do you swear or affirm any testimony you give in this proceeding will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes. Thank you. If you'll uh, follow the bailiff around, I know you have some stuff, and uh, you're welcome. Please watch your step. You're welcome to unpack anything you need, get situated. That uh, microphone does adjust, and then when you're ready, you let me know, and I'm going to allow the attorney's opportunity to ask you some questions. Emily E. Lazaro, M.D. My last name is spelled L-A-Z as in zebra, A-R-O-U. And, uh, Dr., what do, you, what do you do for a living? I'm a general and forensic psychiatrist. And uh, what does that mean, a general and forensic psychiatrist? Well, I'm a, a physician. I'm a psychiatrist. 
I treat patients and um, I do general adult psychiatry where I treat adolescents up through elderly people. Um, and then I also do forensic psychiatry, which is sort of what we're doing here today, where I evaluate cases and talk with a jury and, and teach you guys about, about these cases from a psychiatric standpoint. How long have you been a practicing psychiatrist? Since 2008. Okay, what, tell us about your education when you become a practicing psychiatrist. I got my undergrad, from, uh, undergrad degree from Baylor University in Waco, Texas, and then I went on to do my master's at Texas A&M. Uh, and then I went on to do my resi or medical school at the University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio, Texas. Then I came here to do my uh, residency in psychiatry at USF here in Tampa. In the fourth year of my residency, I was the chief resident over all the psychiatrists. And then uh, I was the first fellow to begin the University of South Florida Department of Psychiatry's forensic psychiatry program, where I graduated from that fellowship. Where, where are you licensed to practice medicine? In Texas, Mississippi, and um, here. And do you belong to any professional memberships? Yes, I'm a member of the Florida Medical Association and the American Academy of Psychiatry and the Law. Aside from your current medical practice, uh, what else have you done uh, in your career? Well, um, I've had the opportunity to do multiple different things. One of the things I did for quite a while is I've, I've worked in the Department of Corrections. I was a forensic psychiatrist, a psychiatrist in the um, psychiatric prison. I've worked on death row. I've worked in multiple different jails where I was the chief psychiatrist there. I've run a, a forensic unit in a, in a psychiatric hospital uh, for people that were awaiting trial either uh, for sanity issues or competency issues and I also ran a not guilty by reason of insanity clinic in the in San Antonio Texas where I treated uh, patients not guilty by reason of insanity in the outpatient setting. <laughs> have you published in papers? Yes. And have you given lectures or presentations in the field of psychiatry? Yes. Um, have you testified in court as an expert in forensic psychiatry? Yes. Approximately how many times would you say this? About 80, a little over 80 times. And about approximately how many of those times involved uh, issues of insanity? Mm. I don't know. Probably a quarter of them. Okay. Maybe more. Judge, at this time, I'll turn to the witness for any questions. I have no questions at this time. All right, you have tea. Now, were you retained by the state of Florida to undergo a forensic examination in the coal mine? To perform one, yes. Okay. Prior to um, meeting with Nicole Notman, uh, what sort of material were you provided in forming the opinions? I got multiple different records. Um, I uh, went through all the jail medical records from Nicole's admission there to um, 2018, deposition of her brother Joseph Carey, deposition of George Lair. Deposition of Eric Lair, deposition of Hunter Lair, deposition of uh, David Lair. Then there was a, a transcript of proceedings. There was a hearing uh, regarding the battered child syndrome, uh, the multi part police interview with Nicole. Um, I also did some of my own research in terms of watching the Snow Queen and Frozen. Uh, Sorry, sorry to interrupt you, Doctor. That's ahead. okay. The rest uh, of the material that you were reviewing. Correct. Uh, the transcript uh, from Florida State University for Nicole Notman. There was a mitigation packet uh, that was provided that included the reports by uh, the report by Dr. Heidi, uh, school and testing records for Nicole Notman from Florida Air Academy, um, the defendant's notice to and for intent to rely upon the defense of insanity, uh, several visitation videos uh, between Nicole and her brother. Uh, Kenny and also her father it was a five total calls there. Uh, CDs of photos from the crime scene, which included a, vid a, a video of the dorm room, uh, vehicle pictures and pictures of the crime scene, pictures of Nicole's, Nicole's clothing, as well as personal items from her purse, uh, video interview of Nicole by law enforcement, 
uh, autopsy photos for Robert Deans and Miriam Deans, uh, the State of Florida Department of Children and Family Reports, um, a stack of papers entitled The Family File, that was over 100 pages, uh, the police reports on this case, which is almost 1,000 pages, another stack of records that appeared to be related to the custody issues, a deposition of Jacqueline Roman, a deposition of Taylor, a deposition of Jeffrey Hartman, a law enforcement crime scene diagram, a telephonic interview with Miriam Lear, um, an interview also with Joseph Lear, a or, I'm sorry, Joseph Carey, um, deposition of uh, Dr. Ewing, and also a deposition of Angelica Hessemer. Now, uh, going back to those jail records that you described, I think that's one of the first things you mentioned on your list. Yes. Um, after reviewing the jail records in this case, was there ever any diagnosis of any psychotic illness in this time? No. Is she being treated for any psychotic illness? No. Is she currently taking any medication for any sort of psychotic illness? No. Right. Besides reviewing all that material, did you also meet with the defendant in this case? Yes. And how many times uh, did you meet with the defendant? I met with her three separate times. And what, was, what would be about the total number of hours you spent with her? According to Attorney Hersey, it's about 14 hours, so I didn't calculate it myself. Okay. And doctor, I'd like to start with the battered child syndrome issue in this case. Yes. Um, Dr. Lazar, do you feel that Nicole Notman meets the standard for battered child syndrome? No. Right. Now, first of all, Ms. Ms. Notman is not currently a child, correct? Correct. And she was, was she, and she was not a child, I guess, at the time when she committed it, or this occurred? Correct. All right. Um, and what is her age now? She's 25. Now, did that factor in your, into your opinion on this issue? No, it didn't. Uh, Dr. Heidi used a personality development scale. Are you aware of that? I'm aware of it only because of Dr. Heidi. Okay. So is that is that a scale that's widely used in your field in diagnosing patients? Objection. Unless he lays a, a better predicate than that. Have you ever used such a scale? No. All right. It, it is, is it's taught in schools. Have you ever seen it taught in schools? No. Have you ever read about it in any magazines or anything, any uh, circular, anything uh, in, the, in the psychiatric field? Well, hopefully I would have read about it in more than a magazine, but I did look at it because Dr. Heidi was on another case that I was involved in at one time, and I did read it, about it extensively because of that. Um, and what I found out that essentially Dr. Heidi was trained by the person that actually designed it, and it was many years ago. I believe Dr. Heidi said it was about 40 years ago when she underwent her training. So. That was 40 years ago, but as far as our clinical practice and somebody that's a psychiatrist in medical school and any of our training and residency, there is no training on that. I've never heard of it before, before Dr. Heidi. Now, um, let's start up first with the uh, physical abuse aspect of the battered child syndrome. Okay. Okay. Um, Tell, tell, tell the jury, uh, if you would, whether or not you feel like she met a battered child syndrome because of physical abuse that she did in her life. Well, I want to talk to you guys a little bit about, about battered child. I know Dr. Ewing brought it up um, as it relates to radiographic evidence because, as he said, that it was first sort of, that terminology was first sort of seen because there was radiographic evidence of people being, of children being battered based upon looking at their bones. But the actual battered child syndrome, as I'm seeing it, as far as psychiatric terminology is concerned, came from what's called the battered woman syndrome. It was actually a terminology described by a psychologist named Lenore Walker in about the 1970s. And essentially what that is, is that she's characterizing what I believe to be PTSD, and now actually Lenore Walker has said that this is also a form of PTSD. Well, I'll caution the witness not to tell us what somebody else said. Okay. Rephrase the question. In my opinion... <laughs> she's, 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 go ahead, Dr. You can finish explaining about, about battered child syndrome. Battered child, uh, battered woman syndrome is, is PTSD. It's just named this for, the, for legal purposes. Um, but the battered woman syndrome, which would be contiguous with the battered child syndrome, describes a cycle of abuse where someone is abused and actively battered, then the abuser goes through sort of an act of contrition and tries to sort of get in the good graces of the person that they battered. Then there's a tension building phase there, and then another battering. 
it has really nothing to do with any kind of inciting event. There doesn't have to be anything for the person to be battered. It just the person's existence makes them a, a victim to be battered by a batterer. So when we're looking at that, and when I'm looking at that, that's what I'm looking at. And when I'm looking at physical battering of someone, I'm looking at battering that is not in response to anything, as you had said yesterday, Attorney Terry, in, in relation to... I'm going to object to, to the answers, Judge, as to, what, as to what Mr. Terry said yesterday. It's for the jury to remember what people are saying in the courtroom, not for her to reiterate and testify on that. Well, I'll, just, I'll instruct the witness not to make reference to what uh, Mr. Terry may have said. Okay, so the legal definition that was discussed yesterday was that there was, uh, in terms of discipline, that's a different thing. Physical abuse and discipline are two different things. Discipline implies that there was something wrong done that had then uh, uh, physical discipline was used in order to correct a behavior. Whereas physical abuse is just abuse that's happening to somebody regardless of anything. And that's sort of a distinction that I make when I look at these cases. Um, in this particular instance, and why I didn't characterize this physical battering as that, was because each one of the instances that I discussed with Nicole, which there were three primary that you guys have heard about, the third grade one, the 10th grade one, and the 11th grade one, each of them had an inciting event, and then there was something that occurred from that. Then I look at the, the sequela of that in terms of physical. Um, and as was brought up earlier in terms of radiographic evidence, if there was some physical evidence of a battering. And in none of these cases was that described to me. There was no evidence of that. No one else on the outside could see it. Not to say that every child that's been abused has physical evidence of that abuse. But that's one of the things that you look at. Was there any bruises? Did you have to receive any medical attention or anything in relation to those instances? And in none of those instances was that the case. So that's what I was looking at when I was looking at this case. And other than those three uh, in, uh, moments, the third grade, 10th grade, and 11th grade that, that you were discussing earlier, did she mention any other uh, abuse, uh, physical abuse that, that in, in, her, in her life with her mother? No. Right. Did... Um, uh, when we're talking about battered child syndrome, are we talking about a situation in which a, a child is continuously abused on a regular basis? I would say that it, when I look at battered children, it is a very regular occurrence. It is, I wouldn't say continuous because they live their lives and, and battered children go to school and everything like everybody else does, but it's very consistent and regular. I would say. So it would be occurring more than three times in 20 years. It'd be occurring on a regular basis, several times a week, and it just had no, it has no rhyme or reason. There's no reason why the child can define to me that they have been abused. Now, there's sometimes where something they did wrong and then there's some, but the abuse extends way beyond discipline. And that's, again, one of the things that I didn't see here. And, do, and Dr. Heidi described it as, very, as limited physical abuse. Do you agree with that? Yes, in her report, yes. yes. And other than those three instances, those were advised to you by, by Ms. Naughton, correct? Yes. And did you ever receive were there any police reports or any um, subsequent documentation or witnesses who uh, describe or observe any abuse to Nicole Mountain? No. And in each of those three events, you said there was something that precipitated it. Was it sort of a disciplinary type issue or, a, or a, an issue with, uh, what, what, what was it that would uh, precipitate it? In the third grade, um, there was an issue, and in, in Nicole's mom was a nurse, and this apparently was an issue with science that Nicole was having a hard time with science. And I guess her mom was trying to describe a concept, and I asked Nicole what that concept was, she couldn't remember. But when her mom was teaching it to her and then asking her questions, regardless of how many times her mom would teach her a concept, she wasn't getting it. And it was frustrating her mother. And I think that that's what precipitated this. It wasn't anything that Nicole necessarily did that was wrong, but it was precipitated because she wasn't 
receiving the information and she wasn't giving it back and and, and and I believe that she was probably doing poorly and her mom was trying to help her and it wasn't getting through and her mother didn't understand based upon I guess what she knew about her cognitive function why it wasn't but when she was getting escalated it was making Nicole more nervous which was only making her forget more and then that just precipitated her mom's aggression toward her frustration toward her and she manifested in a physical way and in both the 10th grade and the 11th grade instances she described with, again, was there a precipitating event to those that, that caused the, the violence? Um, I'm trying to remember back now. Um, the one she didn't tell me about, the one where she got kicked because she was walking like a boy, yes. she didn't tell me about that. I had read that from other people, so that wasn't told to me. But the other instance was a, a time when uh, I guess her mom noticed her handwriting. So Nicole was sitting at the dinner table or a table, and she was writing, and her mom said that she had bad handwriting and pushed her head onto the table like that. Okay. And other than those three instances, she, could, she did not describe any other physical abuse to you that you recall? No. Doctor, how would you describe Ms. Dean's parenting? I believe she was a strict parent in some ways in the sense that she had high expectations for her children and, um, and she was pursuing excellence with them. Do you believe that Ms. Dean's wanted the best for the Cole Mountain? Yeah, I don't have any doubt about that. Do you believe that some of Ms. Dean's parenting uh, skills and mindset might have come from where she came from, where she grew up, how she grew up, and, and the fact that she was in the military? Yes, I mean, I, I, that's why I wanted to speak with her mother. And I discussed some of these things with her mother, and that was sort of the household that she was raised in. She was raised in a household with all boys. Her mom had, had been university educated. Her dad was in the military. And her mom was, was strict also. And she wanted uh, Miriam to be independent, and she sort of pushed her. Um, it was not described to me to be negative in any way, but that, but that was how it was described to me. And so it was sort of consistent with that. And I also spoke with her son about some of the style that she did to him. And it was the consistent thing, that she was expecting excellence, um, but that she would be guiding. He described it to me as, as a guiding, that she would sort of go through stories with him of experiences that she has had in an attempt to help him. I think she had a, a crude style of speaking. Um, again, she was raised in a, in a household with all boys. She was uh, in the military. Um, you know, she she used bad language. Joe told me that also, um, and so I don't agree with that. But as you know, you cannot, as a psychiatrist, put your judgment onto somebody else. And so that was her style, um, and that's how I saw it. <laughs> Now, as far as the, the verbal or psycholo psychological abuse that Dr. Heidi and Dr. Hewing discussed, how would you categorize that? What do you mean, how would I categorize that? Like, would you describe it as severe? Would you describe it as moderate? Would you describe it as uh, not consequential? Well, you have to look at the person that it's happening to. So you have to look at Nicole, and I think that she was, her personality style at least is a little bit more meek. So when you look at somebody like that, um, you would hope that someone with a stronger personality style would sort of tailor that a little bit more to accommodate that meek style. And I don't feel that, that her mom had that insight. And um, so I, I think that, you know, some of what she said was aggressive. I think that some of what she said was definitely hurtful to Nicole. There's no doubt about that. Um, you know, some of the terminology that she had told me, I don't think she told me skank, um, but um, some of the terminology that she told me, you know, the, a lot of the, uh, they're all bad words, you know. I mean, that was used regularly. Um, that wouldn't be my choice of words, but again, it's not my judgment call there. Do you, do you feel that um, the amount of abuse that she or verbal uh, and psychological abuse would amount to a rise to the level of a battered child? No. And again, the, the evidence of the verbal abuse, the things that were said, were told to you by Nicole Lockman, correct? Yes. And there's no, there were no independent witnesses who observed her mom saying things like that to her? 
No, I mean, I, I spoke with Joe and some, you know, he told me about how things were told to him, but no, I, I, there was no one that I could tell. There was nobody that witnessed any of these things that were said to her. So, in, in though misplaced, um, do you feel that some of this uh, verbal abuse and stuff was done in an attempt to motivate and possibly improve her daughter? Yes, and Joe told me about that too. I mean, the style that she used was sort of derogatory at times. And she was using that, picking out your flaws in order to make you try harder. That is a style that some people do. I mean, it certainly was done in medical school to me. But um, again, that is a style. It isn't the best style for certain personality types. Obviously with Joe, it worked fine. He projected forward. Um, but not everybody is going to receive that in the same way. And I think that Nicole did perceive that to be negative and very critical of her. Um, I do think that, yeah. But now in some ways, up until college, Nicole was doing well in school. Yes. She was proceeding along well, correct? Yes. Right. Um, do you feel that Mrs. Deans was an affectionate woman? No. Right. Now... Are all parents uh, super affectionate with their children? No, and, and, and it's different. I mean, I, I don't want to say she wasn't affectionate because Joe told me, you know, that she hugged them and stuff like that. And, you know, I was told that by the grandmother also. But she wasn't overly affectionate. She wasn't a lovey-dovey mom. You know, she wasn't hugging and giving bear hugs and kisses and stuff like that. But again, not everybody does that. But that doesn't mean that you're a bad parent or you're an abusive parent because you're not lovey-dovey. It just doesn't. She had a different style. She's a military officer, and she just had a different style. Now, Doctor, a number of people uh, have testified regarding changes they observed in Nicole, which they say began around the middle, middle, middle school years. Yeah. Now, first of all, before I ask you further, is it unusual for the personality of a child to change as they reach the teenage years? No, that's very common, actually. I mean, that's when you start seeing it. When people start separating and individuating from their parents, that's when you start seeing changes happen. That's why people say, you know, watch out when they become teens. I mean, they start acting different, and they rebel a little bit and things like that. That's very common. So observations by the family that she was, you know, not dancing and singing all the time and, and uh, suddenly like liked to be the computer in her room, that's not uncommon for teenagers, is it? No, that's not uncommon. Now... Regarding the records you observed during your middle school years, did you observe any evidence or any signs of any mental illness during that time period? From the Florida Air Academy? Yes. Yes, I did. Okay. Um, <clears throat> tell us a little bit about that. What I observed in the records were that there were some current concerns about multiple different things, uh, bizarre behavior, um, not getting along with others, um, not fitting in, not remembering other kids' names. I mean, she, she, there were 29 other girls in the squadron. She didn't know any of them. Um, you know, that type of thing. Um, I don't think that her dress was always appropriate. I think she had some problems there. Um, she just had some different likes. The teachers, you know, said that she, you know, liked to shock people, some of her different likes. So that was another thing. It was she had some odd likes that maybe other kids her age did not. And then uh, moving forward, what about her high school years? Did you observe any indications or any evidence of any sort of mental instability during that time? I don't have any records from her high school. I only have Florida Air Academy records. And then how about the college years? I think this is where we start to get into... Um, with the depositions and stuff you covered. Um, first of all, do you have any evidence or anything to indicate that um, she had any issues with her trip to London? No. She told me it was a great time for her. Yeah. Um, now, when she gets to Florida State, um, there are some discussions about her hygiene and uh, other issues during her college years. Are, are you familiar with all that? Yes. Uh, you could talk, talk to us a little bit about that. Well, from her roommate, um, that's where I got most of that information from. She just said that she didn't take care of the room. You know, she, even in spite of having the ability to take care of her room, she wouldn't, she wouldn't take care of it. It was uh, her roommate's impression. And it got to the point where she was just frustrated with her 
um, you know, threw her things out, you know, threw her things out because she had had discussions with her. Um, <coughs> typing in the middle of the night, and she didn't really like people watching her sleep, so that sort of scared her a little bit. Um, Nicole would sleep on her bed without any sheets on it. Just that was very typical behavior. Um, and, you know, that her roommate thought her, that she was rude and disrespectful, that Nicole could do these things, but she wouldn't. So, she, so in the... The roommate would say she could, but she just wouldn't do it? Yeah, that was her impression. She said she was definitely capable to take care of herself. Is it common as well, Doctor, when children go off to college and they don't have a supervisor or parent figure to tell them you need to do this, you need to do that, is it common that sometimes uh, these people will fail to clean up, especially if they're already by nature sloppy or messy? Is that common? That's totally common. I have uh, a lot of my patients are in college and college age, and that's actually one of the things that I talk with them about from that transition because you go from a time where your parents are sort of controlling everything you do and your school schedule is so laid out. You go there, you go to school all day, and then you come home. That's very different when you go off to college because now you're living on your own. You sort of can do what you want. You can eat what you want. You can dress how you want. And then your classes are sort of you can go if you want to or not. I mean, Florida State University is a big university, so there's a lot of students. You can get lost in the crowd there it, it's, it, it, until you get into your senior classes when there's a lot less people. But at the beginning, freshman classes, I mean, there could be several hundred to a thousand people in those classes. So people sort of get lost in the shuffle. So it's certainly one of the things that I talk with my patients about when they get to that time. All right. So, so that, that behavior in and of itself is not anything that would cause you to belong? No, that's extremely normal. Uh, what about the, the lack of hygiene that was discussed? Well, that that I wouldn't say that is extremely normal, but um, for the personality style that I believe Nicole has, it is normal. Um, and some people, I mean, you know, they, they don't care enough about others or what others' opinions of them are that they do, that they don't care about that. That's not a priority to them, and so they don't really focus on that until it's imposed upon them to do. Once they're told to do it, they can do it, but it's not something that they will initiate on them on their own, usually. Right. And, um, so Nicole could do it when she wanted to. She just often would choose not to. Which I'm going to object to the constant leading by Mr. Uh, I'll, I'll just say, don't lead, don't lead the witness. So could she do it if she wanted to? Yes, it's, it's my impression that she could do it if she wanted to. There's evidence to say that she could do all of these things when she wanted to. Is there any evidence to show that from time to time she did take care of herself or she did have care, care where she wore makeup and so forth? Yes, when she was in London, she took care of herself. She talked to me about that. She got bought clothes, she wore makeup, she did her hair. These were all things that she did without being prompted to do them. Um, without any problem. And certainly while she was living, you know, with her parents, she did that because it was an expectation. And when she lived with Joey, she did it too. This was an expectation. But when she's on her own, it's not an expectation. So if she wants to do it, she can. And if she doesn't want to, she doesn't have to. Um, there's evidence, obviously, you read the transcript that her grades began to fall. Yes. Are you aware of that? Yes, I am. And do you have any opinion or any... Uh, well, um, in my um, experience, you know, when you study abroad, it, it, it is a lot easier, I want to say. I mean, and, and it, Cole said, there was more time between classes, it, you know, they're funner classes, you know, it's a different experience. It's supposed to be a positive experience when you study abroad. But then when you come back and you're in the atmosphere of the university setting and you're taking, you know, like when she got back, she's taking 12 credit hours. College is difficult. It's not easy. And you have to do all the studying and everything on your own. <laughs> that is a lot harder. And college is difficult by itself. The volume of material goes way up from high school to college. And again, it's one of the things I talk with my patients about because it is a common problem. A lot of students have a problem in their first semester because they just have to adjust to this new way of doing school. And it is hard. So it's not uncommon for that to happen. Would you say there's also distractions in college as well? Oh, yeah, there's a lot of distractions in college, but I wouldn't say that that was probably one of the issues for Nicole necessarily because they're usually social distractions, and that wasn't something that was really interesting to her. Would you say that because she no longer had um, someone 
forcing her to do her schoolwork that she could possibly have just been letting her schoolwork go by the wayside? Yeah, that's my impression. That again, she needed, she needed that discipline, and she needed that, and and she was used to it being externally motivated. Now she has to be internally motivated, and that again is something. If you don't have that discipline when you're growing up, and you're taught that discipline, it's hard to then all of a sudden get it. You know, it's something that has to be developed. Doctor, there's also there's also a lot of talk about uh, her uh, interest in Elsa and the, the Snow Queen and the Ice Queen. Yes. Um, what is what is your opinion about that? Well, again, that's a whole fringe there. I mean, we have at the Tampa Convention Center this weekend Comic Con. It's a very common thing, and there is a a section of people that enjoy that. It's not, again, out of the range of normal. It's a normal thing for people to do. You know, Power Rangers and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles have several patients that, that are interested in that. It doesn't make them abnormal or anything like that. It's a common thing that people, that are adults, do. All right, so you did not feel that the fact that she wanted to um, dye her hair and to wear and again, a sustained so rephrase. Do you feel that because she wanted to dye her hair and wear an Elsa costume? And again, that was I'm going to object to the leading nature of the question. <coughs> She's testifying very broadly as opposed to Ms. Nachman. She can make her own analysis oh. of, the of, the, of the approach. Plan. She was also, um, during that time period, there's been a lot of testimony regarding her uh, interest in the computer. Yes. Being on the computer all the time. Yes. Um, Doctor, what's your opinion about that? Well, uh, again, uh, that was something that she really liked. It was a hobby to her. If if somebody was doing sports, I wouldn't think anything about spending hours doing that. So again, that was one of the hobbies that she had. She liked to write. She liked to be in that fantasy world. She liked anime. These things were all on the computer. This is something that she really enjoyed. I didn't see that it was something that was wrong that she was doing. I just thought that it was something that she did. It was her hobby. So, Dr. Kamini, with her and reviewing all the materials you previously mentioned, were you able to form a diagnosis regarding the mental health of Nicole Mountain? Yes, I have multiple different diagnoses. All right. What were those diagnoses? Um, the first one is an adjustment disorder with depressed mood. All right, and explain what that is. Well, an adjustment disorder pretty much is exactly what it sounds like. It, it's it's an adjustment. It's, it's your reaction to... A change in your life and this particular situation with Nicole she describes to me starting to feel depressed uh, when she came back from London that you know just what she had the expectation of college was totally different than what what it was she thought it was going to be easier than it was and she thought she was going to do better based upon how she did when she was in school in high school you know she always talks about how she made a 3.8 GPA in high school so she just thought that automatically translates into college your performance there and it doesn't um, again just be based upon the structure and, and the volume and different things like that it requires a certain amount of work and I believe that you know because she started doing poorly that it really affected her emotionally and so I gave her that a diagnosis adjustment disorder and depressed mood she describes being depressed she describes sort of floating out to sea not really knowing a direction because she thought she was doing something and then it wasn't turning out how she thought it was going to turn out and it made her sad so that's exactly what it says an adjustment disorder with depressed mood depression was the um, the emotional response to that adjustment. So what are the symptoms? Just mark the stress that's out of proportion to the stressor. So she described herself as being very sad as it related to this, as, as to recognizing um, how she was doing in school. And it just wasn't what she had expected. What, what other diagnosis did you make? The second one was an avoidant personality disorder. All right, explain to the jury what that is. Personality disorders, I describe to patients as the lens through which we view the world. So how does a person look at the world? Everybody, you know, is born looking at the world in a different way. Um, and, you know, we sort of classify it in psychiatry um, in different clusters, A, B, and C. The A cluster we describe as an odd cluster, and there is schizotypal, schizoid, paranoid personality disorder. Cluster B is the dramatic cluster, and in that is um, antisocial, 
uh, narcissistic, borderline, and histrionic personality. And then cluster C is a nervous personality style. And in that uh, cluster is avoidant, obsessive, compulsive, passive, aggressive, and dependent personality styles. I gave Nicole a personality disorder diagnosis of each one of those clusters, which is rare to do, but in this particular case, it fits. So that's why I did that. So the one that she met the most criteria, the full criteria for, is avoidant personality disorder. That's the first one I'm going to talk about. Again, that's in that cluster C, the nervous personality style. Um, and in that personality disorder, there's seven different uh, criteria. And you only need to meet four of those criteria in order to get that diagnosis. And she meets all seven. Well, what are the seven, Dr. The seven, the first one is avoiding occupational activities that involve significant interpersonal contact because of fears of criticism, disapproval, or rejection. And certainly, Nicole fits that criteria. I'm talking about occupational as her school because she didn't have a job outside of school. Number two is unwilling to get involved with people unless certain of being liked. She had one friend, Laura. And the connection they had was immediate because they both liked anime. And so she knew automatically that they could be friends, and they were. Number three, shows restraint within intimate relationships because of the fear of being shamed or ridiculed. Certainly in her relationship with her mother, that was the case. And I believe in other relationships, too, in depositions, it shows that there's a distance between Nicole and people because if somebody got to know her, they would criticize her. That was her perception. Um, number four is preoccupied with being criticized and rejected in social situations, a similar kind of thing. Five is inhibited in new interpersonal situations because of feelings of inadequacy. Certainly, Nicole had that. She said that multiple times in the interview with me, and in spite of me saying, no, that's not the case, Nicole, she just thought that. She thinks negatively of herself, and that's classic for this disorder. Um, number six is... Um, view self as socially inept, personally unappealing, or inferior to others. Again, Nicole fits that to a T. It's just how she sees herself. That's unfortunate, but that's, again, part of this personality style. And number seven is unusually reluctant to take personal risks or to engage in any new activities because they may prove embarrassing. And there was one instance of one of the friends of Nicole. They were trying to get her to go swimming, and she wouldn't. Not only was she, uh, you know, paranoid about her physical appearance, but just didn't want to mess up kind of thing. So, again, that meets the criteria. So she meets full criteria for that personality style. All right. So now you give us two. You said there, there's more. What's, what's, the, what's the other one? The second one is schizotypal personality disorder. You guys have already heard about that a little bit, but I want to talk with you a little bit about that. Again, that's in that cluster A, the weird personality or the odd personality cluster. There are nine different criteria. You need five in order to meet that diagnosis, and Nicole meets seven of them. So I'll talk with you guys about those. Number one, ideas of reference. You guys have already heard about them. I'll just briefly talk about that. It's when you see something and you take it, at, take it personally, you make per, a personal feeling about it or per, a personal value onto it. And the case, is, as you guys have heard about these posters, thinking that a poster is actually having a personal meaning to you, um, that's what an idea of reference is. So she definitely had that. Um, odd thinking and speech, vague, circumstantial, metaphorical, over-elaborate, stereotyped. That's certainly the way Nicole was in my interview, just over-elaborate talking about something over and over again, very circumstantial, would, would start talking about a topic, go all the way around it, and then come back to it. That kind of odd speech, she would say a lot of phrases over and over again as if she'd said it before. And then I see depositions, and she did say it to other experts, the same phrase to describe the same thing. That, that, is, that meets that criteria. Um, suspiciousness or paranoid ideation. Certainly Nicole had that. She has a, a thing about every, anybody, what their motivations are about her, um, why are they saying the things that they're saying. Now, it's based in reality because Nicole has had some experiences with other people, other kids, that they've sort of tricked her. And it's made her a little paranoid about things she says to people. So it's not delusional of any type. It actually happened and made her paranoid about other people. Um, inappropriate or constricted affect. 
it's very obvious that there is inappropriate and constricted affect in this room here. Um, and it was in the interview with me as well. Just maybe smiling when it really wasn't appropriate or maybe being very, you know, flat whenever it's not appropriate, not as much animation in certain things and an over animation in other things. So again, that goes with that. Um, behavior or appearance that is odd, eccentric, or peculiar. Certainly in my interview with Nicole, she has a different appearance. Um, and it's not off in the sense of not anatomically off, but just odd, different way of doing the hair, different mannerism in terms of how she's sitting and how she's speaking. Um, that meets that criteria. Uh, lack of close friends or confidants other than first degree relatives. You guys already know that based upon everything that you've heard, that really she only had one really good friend with her. So again, meets that criteria. And the final criteria, excessive social anxiety that does not dis diminish with familiarity and tends to be associated with paranoid fears rather than negative judgments of self. Now, I believe that she has sort of both of those things, paranoid fears and negative judgments of self, and we'll talk about that in the last personality style we're talking about. But certainly, she has social anxiety around other people, and she meets that criteria. Well, what's the last uh, personality type you want to the last, personality, the last personality type is borderline personality disorder. Sorry, can you explain what that is? That's in a cluster B, the dramatic personality style category. Now, that they, they have nine criteria there. You only need to meet five criteria to meet that, and she meets six of those criteria. So one of them is a pattern of unstable and intense interpersonal relationships characterized by alternating between extremes of idealization and devaluation. Now, she doesn't have a lot of relationships, so that's one of the issues, but that's because of her other personality styles. I'm focusing on the relationship she has, and the primary relationship she has that she describes to me is her mother, her relationship with her mother. And, you know, you talk, you, know, you look at the deposition uh, from Laura, her best friend, who knew her the best and did see interactions between her mom and Nicole, even if they're just on the phone, and she could see, and she said she loved her. Nicole loved her mom. But at the same time, she'd be very negative about her. And certainly with me, that was the case. Um, and so she meets that criteria, that what we call splitting or black and white thinking um, regarding her mom. Um, identity disturbance, markedly and persistently unstable self-image or sense of self. Nicole doesn't have a sense of self. She doesn't really fit in. She has a hard time understanding where she belongs because she realizes that she's different and she doesn't really know where she fits in. That's classic for this personality style and they just, that emptiness inside, it, it makes them very sad. And that's definitely the case in Nicole's case. Impulsivity in at least two areas that are potentially self-damaging. The two areas that I thought that Nicole had this that were self-damaging uh, were spending and binge eating. She didn't have a lot of money. The money that she got was from her mother, but she overspent it. From what Laura said, she got an allowance of like $50 per week, but she was always behind. She was borrowing money from different people. She borrowed money from David in order to pay the housing. Um, so she was overspending the money that she had, and then the binge eating, you know, she'd eat a bunch of junk food and things like that and hide the wrappers. Um, and did that to her to her detriment because she was at the same time trying to lose weight. So again, that's something that's very common in somebody with borderline personality disorder. Affective instability due to a marked reactivity of mood. So I definitely saw this where they can have episodes of happiness and then intense dysphoria or intense sadness, giddiness and sadness. And that happened here. It happened in my interview. It happened on the, in the phone call, you know, where she's very happy, and then she would get somber. That is a classic for this personality style. And so, again, uh, that she met the criteria. Chronic feelings of emptiness, we talked about this already, due to that lack of sense of self. Just don't know who you are, where you are. She talks about drifting off to sea. You know, she just doesn't know who she is. There's no compass. She has no direction. 
That sense of emptiness is classic for borderline personality disorder. And the final one, transient stress-related paranoid ideation or severe dissociative symptoms. Now, I didn't ever think that Nicole had any dissociative symptoms, but certainly she had stress-related paranoid ideation where she would get stressed out about you know, her mom finding out these things, and then she'd get very, very paranoid about it. Uh, again, you know, she would tell that to other people in depositions as talked about, don't tell mom, don't tell mom, don't tell mom, that kind of thing. Paranoid, overly paranoid for what the situation was. Again, that's classic for borderline personality disorder. Other than those disorders she discussed, personality disorders, did you find any uh, other uh, in diagnosis? Yes, I, I looked at a couple other things. We don't call them diagnoses necessarily, but causes for clinical concern. One of them is parent-child relational problem, which is a V code, um, and that goes without saying. Um, she had difficulties with her mom. There was a parent-child relational problem. That's all that it means. But because of this situation and this cases that we're dealing with, it's a cause for clinical concern because it's the whole basis of why I'm evaluating her. And then the final one, um, uh, I also characterized or have had concerns, clinical concerns about malingering in this case. What is the it's uh, intentional production of false or grossly exaggerated physical or psychi psychological symptoms motivated by ex external incentives. And in this particular case, you know, this legal situation. And is there an actual test for that or do you give actual tests for that? Um, I did a screening test called the SIMS. But it is a clinical examination. It's a clinical evaluation and a clinical judgment. And that was my clinical judgment as well. But the SIMS, which is a test, was supportive of my clinical judgment. Okay. And um, how do you administer that test? It's a true-false test. Um, let me get to that. It's a true-false test um, that it is... 75 questions, and you write circle true and false. Not to hold anything up to the jury that has admitted into evidence. Okay, sorry about that. And, um, so, Doctor, it, it, it comes with instructions on the test? Yes, there's instructions on the front. Right. Um, doctor, if you could read the instructions to the jury, what the instructions say. This booklet contains a series of statements. If you agree with a statement or feel that it's true or usually true, circle true. If you disagree with a statement or you feel that it's false or usually untrue for you, circle false. Please do not skip any items. Please answer all the items the best that you can, even if some are hard or do not seem to apply to you. For example, if you don't have any problems with your memory or if you feel your memory changes have been gradual, you would circle false for this item. I have had a sudden change in my memory. If you make a mistake or you want to change your answer, do not erase. Draw an X through your answer. You do not. You want to change and then circle the correct answer. Before you begin answering the items, please fill in your name, today's date, your gender, your age, and your date of birth, and the space is provided at the top of the next page. All right, and is that the test you administered to um, Nicole Bonham? Yes. And what was your final evaluation on this topic regarding malingering? Uh, she was high on some of the scales of malingering. Now, uh, Dr. Human testified earlier today, and he testified that she was uh, a zero on the scale of malingering as to psychosis. Correct. Right. And you agree with that finding? Yes. So you did not find her malingering when it came to psychosis, but you found her malingering, or did you find her malingering to other aspects? Well, she, and then that's consistent with my interview. She didn't report any symptoms of psychosis, so that was consistent with my interview that she was not malingering psychosis because she wasn't reporting those symptoms. What she did score high on was neurological impairment, affective disorders, which are mood disorders, and amnestic disorders, which is memory problems. All right, aside from those diagnoses, um, let me ask you this. Do you, did you feel that Ms. Nottingham suffered from schizophrenia? No. Okay, then why not? Because she doesn't meet the criteria for schizophrenia. All right, and what does she not mean in your doctor? She doesn't have any of the symptoms. The hallucinations, she doesn't have any hallucinations. I asked her directly about symptoms of consistent with schizophrenia. She denied that. I asked her about the screaming that I, was, I read in other reports. 
She denied that it was screaming. She said that it was a high-pitched tone that she heard, like a, like a flat line. Um, she never described any hallucinations. She never described any voices. She never described visual hallucinations. She never described delusions. I asked her specifically about those items. She did not endorse any of those, which was consistent also with the jail medical records that said she did not have any psychotic symptoms. Nicole was not reporting psychotic symptoms to me, and I asked her extensively about it because I knew it was a cause for clinical concern. Schizotypal personality disorder, as you guys know, I diagnosed her with that. And there are specific things that I look for in that diagnosis. And I specifically asked her about, do you have any types of odd beliefs? Do you think any things have special meanings to you specifically? Um, she denied that, except for to say that she thought that, you know, certain colors had certain meanings. Um, like purple met royalty, um, which is consistent with average people, what average people think. Average people think that purple is royalty. Um, her birthstone's an amethyst, which is also purple. So she had talked about that. Um, she, I asked her, do you feel like others talk about you, trying to elicit some paranoid ideations? Um, and she gave me examples in reality of people talking about her. She gave me an example about some kids in fifth grade that they, she was singing or she was singing and, and some kids appeared to like what she was doing. And then some other kids were talking bad about her behind her back. And then so she said, yes, people have talked about me before, but that is in reality. That is not a psychotic symptom at all. So I asked about, I said, do you feel that others are... Do you like people? Because that's another thing. People are schizophrenic, psychotic. They don't really relate to others. She said it's 50-50. It depends upon the person. I don't like hanging around mean people. So all of this stuff is reality-based. This is not delusions. This is not somebody talking about all kinds of odd things. I've evaluated thousands of people, many people with schizophrenia, and I have not ever had somebody that is psychotic when I'm asking these types of questions for them not to go off into something psychotic. I know the types of questions to ask people to elicit those symptoms because I want to know if they have those. And she did not report those. Are you currently treating people with schizophrenia? Yes. The doctors before had mentioned that they, they, they pop opined that she was, her delusion was that her mom was going to kill her. Did she yes. describe that to you? Yes, she did talk about saying that she felt that her mom was going to kill her. It's the whole basis for this crime. Right. Did you feel that was a delusion? No. <clears throat> Explain why not. I felt that it was her rationale to be able to get out of the consequences of her actions. So I thought that that was the basis of malingering, that she felt that her mother was going to hurt her, and she put that forth as the rationale for this. I did not believe that that was a delusion. So you don't believe she really, truly thought that at the time? No, I don't believe that she thought that at the time. And in fact, let me just say that uh, one of the things that sort of supported that was when I spoke with her about after she had killed Bob and, you know, because she said the whole basis for all of this was that her mom wanted to kill her. Well, I, then I asked her, or then she had said she came forward with this and just said, if my mom didn't want to kill me before, she is going to want to now and her, right, her feeling would be justified because I killed Bob. If she had a delusion about that, she would never have said that. She would never have said, if my mom wanted to kill me before, she certainly wants to kill me now because she knows that that's not, she knows that that's not the case. So she said after she killed Bob, then it was justified that her mom would want to kill her. She didn't have that thought before. Doctor, you've testified that you've um, been in court and testified on regarding insanity. So are you familiar with the insanity standard under Florida law? Yes. Doctor, after doing these evaluations and reviewing all the material, were you able to come up with an opinion as to whether Ms. Naughton was insane when she killed Robert and Marion Deans? Yes. And what is that opinion? She was not insane at the time of the crimes. Right. I'd like to, Doctor, if we could go through the instruction. Starting with 
there's two basic elements that need to be met in this particular instance, correct? Yes. Uh, the first one is she had a mental infirmity, disease, or defect, and I believe you described what those were in your opinion. Yes. So let's go to the next section. Um, because of this condition, um, she A, she did not know what she was doing or its consequences. Now before I get into that, let me, yes. let me ask you, Doctor, do you believe there's any evidence based on what you've seen that, to, that would indicate that she was suffering from a psychosis at the time of the crimes? No. All right, and, and why, why, why is that? She was actively speaking with her family members during the commission of this crime, saw David after she killed her father and was planning to kill her mother. And there was no indication from him that she was acting out of sorts or being psychotic. She had a normal conversation with him. She got the $100 from him and he talked about her. They hugged each other and asked when they were gonna see each other again. That is not a psychotic interaction. She called her grandmother and told her that she was leaving. Sorry she didn't get to see her before she went and said goodbye to her. She got communication from FSU, got the $100 from David, deposited that into her bank account, filled out the housing paperwork, scanned it, and sent it back to FSU between the killing of her father and the killing of her mother. Would a person who's suffering a psychotic break, would they be able to do all that? No. That requires executive functioning, and people with schizophrenia do not have that. They cannot plan like that. They're so caught up in their delusion, they're not in reality. So the fact that she's able to communicate with a university, come up with where she's going to get money, get money, go to the bank, deposit it, scan in an item, well, fill it all out, scan in an item, send it back to university, and get housing between killing one person and killing the second person, that is incompatible with schizophrenia. What, what other evidence would you, would you say would be incompatible with schizophrenia during the course of these crimes? The hygiene has been discussed extensively. For somebody that could not clean themselves, they could clean up an entire murder scene, bleach the entire murder scene, clean it up. Object, I'm going to object to the character, characterization of this evidence. Whoa, 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 approach, approach, no, in effect. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, we will take a break, just so you know, we will take a break after the uh, direct of the witness before the cross. All right, so you mentioned cleaning up the murder scene. What, what, other, what other evidence did you see that would show that this person is not on a psychotic bridge, if you would? Again, on that same line, um, not being able to do her own laundry, but can clean the, put the victim's clothing in the wash and, and clean his clothing. Um, well, what about the, uh, as far as the, the moving of the car. Did, did Ms. Nogman talk to you about that? Yes. Was, was that something that you think that a person who's suffering from a psychotic break would be uh, have the rational mind to do? No. She intentionally moved the car away so the mother would not see the car when she got home. And I asked her specifically about that, and she said that she didn't want her mother to get angrier if she saw the car still there. So that's why she moved the car. She didn't want her mother to see the car. That's what she told me. You know, once she... Once she completed the murder, she went up to school, told her roommate um, that she was there the previous day if anyone asked. After the murder, she met with the police. There's no evidence in the video that there was psycho psychosis. She was in the here and now during the interview. She's answering questions. Yes, she's talking about things that she likes, but she knows she's not going to speak with them about the crime, and she's just holding conversation. She's talking about something that's particular of interest to her. It was not any odd conversation. She was in the here and now. They would ask her questions. She would answer. She'd be polite about it. She'd be able to ask her, make her needs known. This was, this was not an issue. This is not schizophrenia. Um, and then a jail medical records from right after the murders. They do not indicate any evidence of psychosis. She talked about the screaming there. They did not give her a diagnosis of schizophrenia. That alone, even if she continued with the screaming, although she told me something different, um, that is not consistent with hallucinations that are consistent with schizophrenia. And the jail staff knew that, and they didn't give her diagnosis or medication for that. So that's why I say that she did not have psychosis at the time of the crime. All right, going back to the specifically whether or not she knew what she was doing, um, what evidence that you gleaned from this, from, from uh, your interviews with Ms. Notman, that, that would show you that she knew what she was doing at the time of his murders? In her interview with me, she told me that she shot and killed Bob instead of killing herself, that she knew that killing Bob was wrong, that she shot Bob once in the head, and that she knew that she killed him, 
And then when she thought when the, somebody would hear that loud noise, the police would get called and they would come there. She knew that if her mother didn't want to kill her now, like I told you, she would be justified in killing now because Bob was dead. Another thing, when she told jo Joseph on the phone after this had happened and she was admitting to him uh, the crime, she said to him, I didn't think I could do it, but I did. That was when she killed Bob. That's how she described that. She told her brother goodbye. She hugged David goodbye. One last hug because she knew that the consequences of her actions were that she was going to be taken away from them for a long time due to this. She told Joe on the phone that she was going to miss him. Well, she knew she was going to be gone after this. She told me that she was going to be on the run after this, that she'd need a false ID or passport because she'd be stopped from leaving the country because she'd be wanted for this crime. She knew that using a gun on someone and shooting them in the head would result in her death because she talked about shooting herself in the head to kill herself right before she did this, right before she killed the other two victims and shot them in the head. She so knew that. So those are evidence she knew what she was doing. What about the consequences portion of this? Well, the consequences of that we already sort of discussed in terms of being gone and not being back. Um, and what about um, that she knew that it was wrong? Well, there was evidence that to show that she knew that the murders were wrong, not only because she told me that, but also the actions that Nicole took to cover up the murders. Uh, she, right before this, was doing searches on her phone for dangerous areas in Tampa and people in low places looking for someone to help her after she did this. Did, did she explain to you what that meant? Yes, looking for people that are what she perceived to be shady to be able to help her with this, to be able to help her get a fake ID or a passport because she knew that she couldn't use her own ID after she had done this because she'd be wanted and that people would know who she was. She told her family she was leaving for school on the 19th. So she was going to be gone before her mom was killed. She told her mother that she was in college, told her about her roommates, let her mom think that she was up there in school when she knew that she was at home. So, so while she was at home, she had communication with her mother? Yes, she Did had she... communication with her mother and talked to her about her roommates and, and things like that, that she was up at school and she told her about her roommates. Her mom asked her about her roommates and she talked with her about that. But she, didn't, she hadn't met her roommates yet, had she? No, but she was telling her mom that because she didn't want her mom to know that she was there waiting for her at her home. Um, she moved the car distance from her home so her mother wouldn't know she was there. She cleaned the crime scene with bleach, washed the victim's clothing in the washing machine. She moved the body to the back room and locked the door. Once she killed her mother, she ran to her car almost two miles away and disposed of the murder weapon, which the police have never found. She told me that she threw it away because it was not a good idea for her to have a gun that two people had already been shot and she didn't want anyone else to get hurt. So again, she knew that. She drove up to the school, told each of her roommates a different story. Yes. For the record. You want to approach? I like you were saying you did something about her driving up to school. No, was, yeah, she drove up to school, told each of her roommates a different story about her mother. One roommate, she told her mother was dead. One roommate, she told her mother was in the hospital. She told her brother a story about the murders, though she admitted that she did it. She didn't give a true account of it. She said that she went back up to school and got a sign, and then came back to kill her mother because now it's the right thing to do because these signs gave her that impression that it was the right thing to do. She told her uncle Eric she had nothing to do with the crime, nothing to do with the deaths. Um, Nicole told me that the crime that she did was serious, and how the context of this was because she told me when her mom called her about the roommates, she couldn't tell me the exact conversation about the roommates because of the seriousness of the crime. She was focused on that and not on what her mom was talking about. Um, she told me that she was going to Ta Tallahassee temporarily because she knew the police were coming for her because she knows that she shot that someone, she knows that someone saw her shoot her mother in the driveway. So she knew that someone saw her. So she knew the police were coming after her because she knew someone knew. And then on the way up there, she was listening to the news to see what was going on because she knew that she committed a crime that was newsworthy because she killed two people. So all of those things told me that she knew that the murders were wrong. Judge 
my man will move. Absolutely. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take our afternoon break. It'll be about a 15-minute break. I will instruct you not to discuss the case amongst yourselves or with anyone else, not to do any research related to the case, and avoid all exposure to the case outside of the courtroom. All rise for the jury. Step down and enjoy the break. Please do not discuss your testimony unless with anyone, unless all the attorneys are present. We'll take a 15-minute break. We'll come back and we'll pick up with the cross-examination.